Hey, are we live? <laughs> yes, I think so. Um, I see myself anyway. I hope you guys can see me. I hope you can hear me good. Let me know um, that the sound is okay, anyone. Uh, I, I, I can never tell until we actually go live. Welcome. Welcome, everybody who is here on the live stream. And welcome to everybody who is watching this later as a recording. Um, the, what we're going to do is answer questions today about learning and playing guitar. No question is off limits. I am going to try to get to everybody. A couple of housekeeping things. When you ask a question live, please start with the word question. The thing is, um, I'm by myself and I, I, my eyes aren't that great. So I look down the list and there's a lot. And if I don't see question, I, I can't really stop there. I keep going on until I see something that says question. But I am going to start with questions that have been pre-submitted. And uh, you can always do that. The nice thing about pre-submitted questions is it gives me a chance to kind of read them over and even prepare. That's why I got this little board in the background because somebody asked a question about uh, theory and I thought I'd, I'd do a little extra and do something on the board. So, hey, Tim, welcome. Shulamit, good to see everybody. Jack, nice to see you. Martin, okay, and Michael. Wow, we've got a good line of Bauer. Welcome. Let me, uh, I got a little banner here just to remind people. And of course, when people come in late, they don't, they don't know to write the word question. I've said it in the beginning. So after I answer all the pre submitted questions, then I'll answer the questions that are live. I'll go ahead and do the monthly drawing. The drawing is for people who are members of, of my Real Guitar Success membership. They get a chance to complete 20 practice sessions in a month, one per weekday. And then at the end, I put them in a drawing and you get a, a chance to win a $50 gift card, Amazon gift card. Of course, the real win is just the encouragement. What I'm trying to do is to get people to practice these things with a variety of different aspects of playing guitar. And little by little, they'll keep improving your guitar playing. So more important than the $50 gift card, but well, nice to have that too. Okay, let's start off with the first question. And I've made it big so I can read the pre-submitted ones really easily. <laughs> First one is by, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. I know it's French. V-I-A-N-N-E-Y. Vine? Vine? I would love to get corrected on that, but uh, for now we'll go with that. When I play with the backing tracks, I'm having difficulties keeping an eye on the tablature and my fingers at the same time. Should I look at the tabs or the fretboard? I could memorize the tabs and just look at the fretboard to position my fingers properly. So he's specifically asking about the tabs in the uh, um, Beginner's Journey and the Second Adventure. It's uh, all about reading tabs. And because it's about reading tabs, I'm going to say it's not a good place to memorize the tabs because you're practicing actually reading tabs. If it was anything else, especially chords, I would suggest just memorize it. Because when you're playing guitar, you don't normally have to look at the paper and read the chord and play it. Usually, if you're playing a song, you want to memorize the song at least pretty well so you can focus on the singing or other parts, little subtleties. But with this particular aspect, you're practicing reading music. So there's no point in memorizing it. It's a practice. And try to not worry too much about getting it just perfect. That's part of practice. Think of it like when you're exercising. You don't try to get the exercise perfect. The benefit is from doing it. And of course, you get maybe better over time, but that's not the goal. The goal is to get the development from the exercise. And that's the same with practicing reading tablature in the second adventure. Now, he's also asked about, should I look at my fingers? When you are reading music, in general, either tab or standard notation, that's, that's an actual skill. And I've learned over the years when I'm reading music and I have to play with somebody right away from the music, no chance to memorize it, I need to kind of constantly force my eyes to look ahead so I see what's coming up. And it's a skill you develop. It's not something that you just are able to do with a, you know, a trick. I'm looking ahead, so I'm looking a measure or so ahead so that I see what's coming up. But if I see a note and I have to play it at the same time, I'm already a little bit behind. So reading music is something that the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And 
you want to train your eyes to kind of look a little bit ahead. In the case of the second adventure, I wouldn't worry too much about that. You, the idea is to get you used to reading tab, but when you normally use tab, at least in my lessons, but mostly you're going to have a chance to look at them and just figure out from the tab what you're playing. You're not going to just have to sight read. So that's what we call when you just get a piece of music and you read it and are supposed to play it well. That's sight reading. That's not really a necessary skill for most guitar players. The skill involved is just using the tab to figure out the fingering or whatever lick you're supposed to play. And then you go on from there and usually memorize it. But for the second adventure, don't bother memorizing it. <laughs> uh, good. How now here now we're getting into some theory stuff. Okay, I'll do a little session on guitar theory. How come an F sharp is played rather than an F in the G major scale? G major scale. Well, uh, because if you played an F, it wouldn't sound like a G major scale. That that's kind of the simple answer. Here's an F. Now it doesn't sound like a major scale. So I'm going to combine this with the next question and it'll make a little more sense. That's sort of the superficial answer, but now I'm going to go into what makes a major scale. First of all, a major scale, the sound that you're used to hearing is created by the distance between notes. And there are different ways to think about this. Some people uh, think of scales as uh, just a combination of where the sharps and flats are. But in my mind, it's more important to realize that the sound is created by the distance between the notes. We use names for these distances. They're typically called intervals. And we have all kinds of names, minor second, major second. It, it has to do with, on the guitar, how many frets you could say. So if one fret is called a minor or half step or a minor second. Um, a semi-quiver in Europe, I think they use. I will call them um, half steps and whole steps for now. One half step is one note, one fret rather. Two frets would be one whole step. Um, one and a half steps would be three half steps, so on. Uh, and this will come in handy in a minute. So the scale is a note, seven notes, a major scale is seven notes that are spaced very particular. It's actually a formula. So it's spaced whole step from G, the in this case it's a G scale, G to A, a whole step, whole step, half step, then whole step, whole step, half step. I consider this, it's just a duplicate of the first note, or more accurately, it's an octave. It's not the exact same note, but it's a G note one octave higher, higher pitch G note. So the seven notes make up the scale. Now, I'm going to go to my board. I figured out right away that I'm going to have to step away because otherwise it won't focus on the board. You see, the board's a little blurry. But if I step away, it'll get in focus. So let me do that for a minute. Now, I think the board is getting into focus. By the way, I think everybody can hear me. Yeah, I don't see any. <laughs> I can't hear you. Okay, so the board's in focus now. Here's that half step, whole step formula for a major scale. This means one step, one step, half step, one step, one step, half step. Now I've used G as an example, but it works with every scale, every scale. I'm talking every major scale. It's the exact same formula. It just depends on where you start and then you go whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step. So let's take C. I wrote it in black above for an example. C to D is a whole step. D to E is a half step. E to F is I'm sorry, D to E is a whole step. E to F is the half step. See, I'm using exact um, reference to the G scale. F to G whole, G to A whole. A to B is, mm, oh, I did something wrong. Mm, let me see, G, A, B. Whole, whole, half, whole, whole, F, G, A, B. The half is right here. B to C is the half step. Hmm. I got to think, what did I do wrong here? Whole, whole, half, whole, whole, A. It's not going to be B flat. Uh, whole, A, A, B, C, D, E, F. I, oh, I did it wrong on both counts. That's the problem. We will fix that right now. There. 
Ah. And well, FG. There we go. Whoo. Okay. So the formula is whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Now I have to include that last note. Whole from C to D, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 and B to C is half. Half step. We got it. Now I'm going to talk about chords using kind of what we just talked about. Uh, and I'll, let's go on to the next question. This is by Michael. How do you explain a C major chord having to being the notes C, E, and G, and then an E minor chord being E, G, and B? Well, it again has to do with those intervals. The intervals make up a chord as well as a scale. So a C, E, G note is a C chord, and what we've done is taken the C to E to G. The formula for a major chord is <laughs> one step. What is I doing? This is not right. <laughs> it's two and one and a half. Yes, I did this late at night and I was probably half asleep. Okay, we got this. This is two and one and a half. And this is going to be two and one and a half. Yes, I'm sure I was half asleep when I wrote this. Ah, so two full steps from the first note, G to B for a major chord, and from B to D is one and a half steps. Half and a whole together, one and a half steps. Makes a G major chord. Same with C, C, E, G, two steps, one and a half from E to G. Now for the minor chord, it's kind of switched around. It's one and a half steps to the next note, and then from there, two steps. So if you take E, E to G is one and a half steps. You can see it here, E to G, if you add this up, half and a whole, and G to B is two steps. So that's the basics of chord theory, so to speak, you can construct any major minor chord. You just start with the first note. You go up two steps, whatever that note is. Then you go up one and a half steps, add that note to it. You've got a major chord. Whatever you start with, that's the name of the major chord. If I play a B chord and I go from B, C is a half step, to D, I need another half step. It's going to be D sharp. And then I go from D sharp to E to F sharp, because E to F is a half step normally, has to be F sharp, then you have a B major chord. If I went from B to D natural, and then to F sharp, right, a half step lower, that's going to squish that to one and a half steps, and then two steps on top. When you squish the middle note down the half step, it opens up to two steps on top. Now you've got a B minor chord, and it works for every single note. Okay, so there's our theory lesson for today. Let's go on. So, it, uh, I'm gonna answer this one too. It's connected. In the key of C, is there ever a D major chord? And then he's saying in the key of G, is there ever a D minor chord? Because you can see what he's referring to. One more theory. Let's do this. I'm gonna use the big M for major little m for minor. And this one's diminished. I'll use a little circle. So in a scale, if you take notes just out of the scale and you make chords, the G chord, and you're going to make a, a chord by every other note. So the G chord, like here, is going to be major. A, you take every other note, it's going to be fall minor every time. If you take a major scale and you form a chord from it, B is going to be minor, C, and so on. If you take any scale and you do that, you start with the first note, and every other note, you're going to get the first one's going to be major, the second one's going to be minor, and so on. And what he's saying is, in the key of C, here's C, is the D ever going to be major? If you're staying true to that particular key and not going out of the key, no, it's always going to be D major. It's never going to be minor. And the same with G. The D is always going to be, mm, that should be uh, C, D. The D is always going to be major. It's never going to be minor. 
the D here is always going to be minor. <laughs> I said major. Okay, the D here is going to be minor always in the key of C because it falls as the number two chord. And again, what you're, I'm actually describing is sort of two different ways of looking at the same beast. What I'm describing is it has to do with the intervals because when you take every other note out of a scale, it falls in that group of intervals. If you take the first note and go every other note, it's going to be two steps on the bottom and then one and a half step. It's, that's the way it's going to fall. So it's kind of two different ways of looking at it. Um, let's go on to some technique. Ha may ask, I find a lot of trouble with hammer-ons and pull-offs. Is there any good exercise to practice daily in order to learn these techniques? Definitely. And that's just the way to go about it, is find an exercise. And I use different exercises depending on the different level of the student. Now, I know Harme's, I hope I'm saying that right, J-A-U-M-E, has been playing for a little while. So this is the exercise I use still to this day. Oh, let's, <clears throat> let's show my guitar now. Here we go. This is a hammer-on. And then you hit here three times. Then you move the whole thing up one fret. And so on. I'll usually go up to about, I'll go up to about seventh fret, but people starting out usually just go up to five. Now, that's hammer-ons, practicing hammer-ons, and that's strenuous. I'd start there. But once you get the hang of that, then you go backwards using pull-offs. This is the same thing in reverse using pull-offs. That's my favorite exercise. And you can break it down. You can start, you know, with a simple going hammer-ons. Don't go so far because you get tired. And as you get more uh, strength in your fingers, you can go up higher and then start going back down. And then you can kind of expand it to go all the way up and down. Do a little bit at a time. You're going to get sore at first. Your pinky is going to get strong. It's a good pinky straightener as well as a hammer and pull-off exercise. Now, if you're for a beginner, this is probably not the best place to start. What I would do is just do some simple hammer-on and uh, pull-off exercise. Um, I have some exercise. What I'm going to do is I'll put a link in the show notes. And I'll put a link to maybe a couple exercises so you can kind of pick one that's best for your level. And including uh, some version of this exercise. Um, then maybe I'll find a simpler one too. Sometimes uh, I have students do exercises on chords too, like this. So they get used to hammering on and pulling off within a chord. It's a fun technique and it sounds good. Okay, Paul, oh, I'm sorry, let's go with Janet first. It says, I'm at an intermediate level and I haven't touched the guitar for three years. I would like to start playing again, but honestly, I don't know where to start. Part of what stops me is knowing that the pain in my fingers will go, uh, that I'll go through and how awful, awful it will be. And yes, on a steel string guitar, if you haven't played for a while, even for months, it's going to hurt when you get back to it, depending on, you know, how long you were playing before that. But certainly three years, it will hurt. Your fingers got soft. It's partly uh, calluses, but partly your fingers get desensitized when you're doing it regularly. And the two together make it not hurt anymore after a while. So first of all, let's talk about where to start. I couldn't tell anybody exactly where they need to be. Even if I saw them in person, I could make some guesses, but usually I'd make some guesses and then have them do it for a while and see what happens and then make some more choices. But it is something you could do yourself and I do for myself all the time. Janet, you're a member of Real Guitar Success. The thing to do is to go into the material, try to remember what you were working on and start experimenting with some things and find that spot that is not so easy that it's just boring and tedious, but 
at the same time is not so hard that you just can't play it. Find something that will be a little bit of review and then start moving forward. Now, there are clear spaces in Real Guitar Success, like the Beginner's Journey and the Bar Chords for Everyone course, that are very methodical. So once you find a place that's a little bit challenging, but still has some review for you, it's not totally new, work on that and start moving forward from there and find out where it starts getting harder and harder. And you can also try experimenting with some areas like within the um, uh, university, there's a bunch of different courses. And if you find something that interests you, see if you can find something that's review in there, but still has some interest for you. It still has some challenge for you. And then from there, start moving forward. I always recommend people who haven't been playing for a while, find a place to do some review. Don't just try to do something totally brand new. You're not taking advantage of the work that you did before. And I think it's partly motivation, but it's partly you want to kind of get your skills back to where you were and then move forward, not just jump into something brand new. Uh, there's no exact science to this. Sometimes you have to start and find out maybe that's not the best place and give it another shot, but take some time to think about it. And I would even not play for a little bit and spend five minutes or so looking through and see what kind of speaks to you. What, hey, yeah, I remember that. That that was, I was getting pretty good at that, but I never quite perfected it. Maybe I want to go back and give that another shot and see where I'm at with that. Maybe it's too hard. Okay, let me back up a little and, you know, kind of adjust until you find something that seems to really fit and you feel inspired to keep moving forward. Now, about the fingering thing. Uh, First of all, it works better, especially when you're first getting back into it, to do short sessions and do lots of them, as opposed to doing a long session and being really sore and then not wanting to play for several days. Do 10, 15 minute sessions, maybe even twice a day. And start doing warm up exercises that are kind of easy, more of like no brainers to get your fingers moving. I like this one. Jan, because you've been playing for a while, that's a good one for you. If you haven't, I'd start with just the three fingers. The pinky's hard for beginners, usually. And uh, a more advanced exercise is to do this. Uh, there we go. So any part of that exercise is a good warm-up exercise. Um, okay, I think that's all I have to say about that. I did uh, create a um, an email to students that elaborate on that a little bit more, and uh, I I I think uh, I think if I haven't already, I'll send you a copy of that email. Next, Paul asks. I'm using light gauge strings, and when I hammer a chord, I hear buzzing. My strings are only three weeks old. Should I go to a medium gauge, or will that be harder to play chords? First of all, a medium gauge will be harder. It's more tension. Usually, I stay with light or extra light strings for myself. And students, I wouldn't recommend going to medium. The only advantage of medium, really, is it's louder. And if you're playing and singing and you need the volume, that's the time for medium. But there's no advantage in terms of buzzing that I'm aware of. Interestingly enough, I was just having that same problem. A lot of students, it has to do with their technique. They're not putting their finger in just the right spot. So you might want to back up and slow down and see what it takes. The other thing I find, which was I was dealing with, I was hitting the string harder than I need to hit. So let me explain something. You can have a technician uh, adjust your guitar. And it has to do a combination of adjusting the neck, the nut, and the bridge and sometimes filing the frets if they're not even. Uh, that's a more elaborate thing, but that's a part of a full setup. So that your guitar strings are as low as you can get them without buzzing. But it's not that simple because it depends on how hard you hit the string and your playing style as well. So if you hit the string light, you can actually get the strings lower to the neck before they buzz. If you really bang on the strings, you want them higher because they're going to buzz if they're too low. So part of that is technique. It's not just the guitar. I was hitting the strings really hard, and I found I can hit a little lighter and get less buzzing and get my strings a little lower. I did have somebody adjust my guitar recently, so I know kind of what I'm working with. I also decided I want my bass strings a little bit higher. So I did an adjustment. I'm not sure I want to fully recommend this right now. But what I did is I put a little teeny wood 
a sliver underneath the bridge on the base side, which raised the base up oh, a little teeny bit, not even an eighth of an inch, more like a maybe a sixteenth of an inch. And it was just enough. Now, no buzzing. But watch, I can make it buzz. Hear it? If I hit that hard, I am working at not hitting that hard. I don't need to. And you might consider how hard are you hitting the strings. So it's a combination of adjustment on your guitar, how hard you're hitting with your pick, how accurate you are with your fingers in your left hand. That's a big one for students. I notice a lot of times they say something's wrong with my guitar and I'm looking where their, their finger isn't as close to the fret as it needs to be. See, I can make my string buzz. Just move the finger back. And it, particularly with chords, because you got many other fingers to deal with at the same time. Look at that. So, I move my finger up on the left hand. No buzzing. I can hit just as hard. Buzzing. Medium strings aren't the answer. Maybe a guitar adjustment might be the answer. And if you've never done that, I recommend it. I know it, it's going to cost some money. I don't really recommend doing it yourself unless you're willing to do some studying and some experimenting on your guitar. And hopefully you have more than one guitar. If you mess it up, you still can keep playing. Probably a good idea to have a professional do it. At least for me, I know some little things I can do to my guitar. I still send it to um, Adam, who is great with my guitars and, and adjusts them. And I think most acoustic guitars, even very expensive ones, need adjustment. Unless they, at, at the place that you bought it, they do an adjustment before you take it home. And even then, adjustment doesn't always last. The neck itself will bend back and forth. So buzzing is, is sometimes, and it's a balance with how close you get the strings and, and um, how, how hard it is to press the strings. So for some people, they're willing to accept buzzing to get the strings nice and close and easier to play. So that's a thing too. Everybody has little different preferences. Those are some things to think about, Paul. Um, oh, by the way, I want to mention to you, Janet, one thing about uh, the pain with your fingers, you might want to put really light strings on your guitar at first also. Or if you really want to go for it, get these things called uh, silk and steel strings. They're kind of a combination of nylon and steel, and it'll make it easier on your fingers. And Paul, um, if you have light gauge strings and they're brand new, yeah, it's not the strings, probably adjustment on your guitar, then take a look at the way you're playing and see if you can move your fingers around and make it not buzz so much or hit a little softer and see what happens. What are the steps for taking a song with only chords into a fingerstyle piece? And uh, this is Rod, and he's asking, how can, if you know the chords to a song and the melody, how can you arrange that, that's the actual word we use, into a fingerstyle? And what he's asking is, where you play the melody and the chords together. Let me see if I can play. Um, okay, I've got a bad nail here, but I glued it on. I think it's going to work fine. Okay, let me see. I'll play something. I'm playing the melody and chords, or... So that's a finger style with a melody and chords. <laughs> I got a fake nail on here because I broke the nail and I'm not quite used to it. Um, what you're asking, first of all, Rod, I want to tell you is not a simple thing. There's not some magic trick. And I just want to make sure that's on the table. You don't just play chords and you know the song and you just do this and this and now you can play a melody and chords because there's two aspects to it. First of all, there's technique involved. And it takes a while to learn the technique to be able to play a melody and chords together. That doesn't come just by playing chords. And the way you learn that is you start with very simple pieces and you build up. So you start with simple pieces that somebody else has figured out how to play. And you either read the tablature, the notes, or you know, if somebody shows you a video step by step how to play it, you figure out how to play each of the parts and then learn to play it. That trains your fingers what to do, how to play chords and melody together. And of course, as you get into more elaborate pieces, there are techniques that you'll use that are more elaborate and sound cool, but take more practice. That's one aspect, the technique. But then there's the actual choices you make in arranging. That's a whole skill. 
arranging a song on a big scale people get paid lots of money to arrange songs for movies and other things they're deciding where to put the melody and the chords and how to divide it up among instruments and parts that's a whole thing so for solo guitar you're just arranging a piece so that you can play it with a melody and chords but that takes practice and judgment and you get that judgment over years of doing it i mean years to be able to arrange a song and so it sounds good in a chord and melody from just having the chords and melody with no help takes years of, of ability of skill of practice and again you get there by playing simple chord melody songs and then little by year your ears train what you like and what you don't like and you can kind of take that as a as a, an example and use it to make your own songs i love arranging songs but it's it takes time to really get something i really like takes me uh you know working on it for weeks at a time until and making little changes until i get it the way i want and of course i have to make sure i can play everything that i arrange so that's the technique aspect so i do have a blog post that kind of outlines specific steps that you do again it's not a magic fix you don't just follow these steps and all of a sudden you got a song you need to be able to play it technique wise and have the judgment from experience of what's going to sound good with the melody and chords together but you got to start somewhere and the way to start is I'll, I'll put a link to that blog post in the show notes and find some very simple pieces that aren't too hard for you to learn and add those to your repertoire and little by little you'll get a better sense of what it takes to actually play technique wise and what makes sense hearing wise in terms of melody and chords together okay good question rod this is something that i really enjoy i wish there was like a a quick easy way to teach students to do it but i haven't found it yet jeff next question ah chords we're going to talk a little about chords in the next couple of questions i'm looking to see if there's any questions that are just obviously related to what we've already been talking about here i don't see anything jeff is asking what chords should be committed to memory versus needed uh, learned as needed any advice currently i'm trying to learn the a and g major chords i think that's what he's saying and the a and g minor chords and the a and g seventh chords is this appropriate um <clears throat> my preference for learning chords is to not just memorize one chord in all the forms um, it's to work on chords that go together so you can use them and practice them it's one thing to intellectually know how to play the chord but it's another to actually be able to play it in context of a song with strumming changing chords that's another animal so by learning a bunch of chords you're kind of you're not giving yourself a chance to actually integrate the chords into your playing and i i think that's not the best way to do it it's it is kind of an intellectual approach and i've been guilty of that more than one more than once <laughs> yes english thomas once <laughs> Uh, kind of doing something I think is in intellectually interesting in other words kind of tickles my brain but doesn't really turn into practical application very easily I'm not saying you're hurting yourself by practicing the A and G major chords and all that but it's not the most efficient way to get to where you want to go playing good guitar and playing some form of songs or improvising or something my advice would be to learn two three chords that fit together in a key do some practice with them play some play along tracks maybe learn a song even a simple song uh, get so you can change from those three chords fairly quickly and easily and then add a fourth chord from that key then maybe try the same thing in a different key and start f working on the same process do one two two chords three chords four chords in another key stay with the five most popular keys of guitar that's um, C G D A and E those are the five 
most common keys for guitar. And I would stay with that, you know, for quite a while, unless you're playing some kind of music that for some reason is using different keys. Probably not going to, probably not going to need different keys than that. So, and the, what I was doing is I started with C and just went up five. That's how I memorized that. C, C, D, E, F, G, G, A, B, C, D, D, E, F, G, A, A, B, C, D, E. I just counted up five from each, starting with C. Um, seventh chords, um, when you learn seventh chords, it's m more, uh, how do I say this? It's more efficient to learn the seventh chords when you're gonna need them as the five chord in a key. So let me explain quickly. In a key, the first chord in the key is the name of the key. C would be the C chord. If you count up five, that would get you the five chord. C, D, E, F, G. In the key of C, the five chord is G. And you can do that for any key. You gotta watch for sharps and flats here, but if you stay with those five keys, it's not that hard. Learn this G chord, a G7 of that, because the five chord in the key sounds good with a seventh added to it often. And that's where you're gonna use it most often. That's not the only place, especially when you get to blues, but that's the most efficient way is to learn the five chord, learn the G7, learn if you're working on the key of A, the E7 is what you're gonna need for the five chord, right? A, B, C, D, E, and so on. Remember, we've got five keys, C, G, D, A, and E, those five keys. So I hope that helps. And Jeff, I believe you're a member also. That's kind of what I'm doing. If you follow along the beginner's journey and then the bar chord, I'm doing a, everything and keep coming back to putting them together in the appropriate chord progressions and keys that will make sense for modern popular music. And I'm talking the breadth of jazz, rock, country, and all that. Um, so you might want to go back and look at the lessons themselves and follow the pattern that I've, I've set out in the lessons in the Real Guitar Success Academy. And he also asks, one item I'm not finding on your site is chord charts. Um, I use them as sort of flashcards in a spelling bee. Uh, is this perhaps something I should not be doing? No, I think that's fine. But see, now that I've explained the first part, that's why I don't do chord charts. I don't want people just learning random chords. I want to train them to learn chords, learn to chords in a key that they're going to normally use it, and then get practice switching smoothly and strumming it. <coughs> Excuse me. I need something to drink. Strumming. Ah, better. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing. Um, so, I'm not saying chord charts aren't, can't be useful. I have a chord book that says 7,000 chords, and every now and then I need a chord. And what I'll do is I'll go to that, and what I want is a page of different versions of that chord. I, and in that book, every page has like uh, 20 versions, at least a dozen. I might be exaggerating 20, but at least a dozen versions. And I'm looking for the version that's going to fit what I want to do with it. Let's say I'm using a song and I might use a different version. If I, all the chords are up here, I don't want to play one chord way down here. So I want to find a version that's up here with the other chords or vice versa. So that's where it comes in handy. And I think it <clears throat> having a chord chart may be handy to just kind of validate Keep in mind, you can play chords many different ways. So the one on the chord chart might not be the only one that you're going to uh, need, only form that you're going to need. Mm, I think that's all I want to say about that for now. I, I wouldn't be opposed to making a chord chart. Uh, what I do do is every on every lesson in the practice sessions, the monthly practice sessions, I include a sheet. And in the sheet, there's a chord diagram for all the chords in that lesson. So the chords are there. Uh, I'm not sure it'd be the best use of my time to kind of compile all those chords into one piece of paper. And of course, you can, on Amazon for five bucks or you know 10, you can get a, a chord chart and put it on your wall, a poster that's laminated. So uh, maybe 10 bucks, but you know what I'm saying. I'm not sure me making another version of that is gonna be that useful. I, I would like, 
you to have the chord diagram when you need it right there on the lesson so you can refer to it and make sure you're fingering it properly. But I'm not opposed to it. If, if I get enough people requesting a chord chart, I'll make something up. I did make a bar chord, uh, bar chord chord chart. Tell you the truth, I don't think it's all that useful, but people wanted it, <laughs> so I made it. Um, again, I'd rather teach bar chords step by step in a key, learn to change between them, and learn the form so you can make your own bar chords, not just look at a diagram. And bar chords that have a formula are really easy. You know, you if you know the root note and you know the form, a major, minor, seventh, so on, you can find that bar chord anywhere on the neck. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> I feel like I'm preaching now. Let's go on. The picking hand. Oh, yes. Let's talk about the picking hand. Uh, so we're going to talk about strumming a little bit. I hold the uh, th pick between my thumb and the pad of my finger. <clears throat> so that doesn't tell me a lot because you could hold it this way between the thumb and your pad. You can hold it this way between the thumb and your pad. You can, you can do that way. <laughs> uh, and some people do that. They strum like this. Uh, but I, I get the idea. Let's go on. Lately, I'm getting pain in part of my palm somewhere in here. Am I holding a pick too tight? Any ideas on how to fix this problem? Uh, yes. And ironically, I have recently uh, found some pain in here. I always treat pain as, as a message. I'm doing something that I need to watch what I'm doing. And it's not the message is I'm doing it wrong. Sometimes it takes an adapting and the pain goes away from adapting, but I'm listening. I'm not just ignoring it and saying, oh, it'll go away. And then I'll try a few different things and see if it changes the feel. And then I do that for a while and see if, if I'm getting used to it or if, if I think it's actually create, creating problems in my hand. So listen to your pain. And again, it's not automatically you're doing it wrong and, and stop doing it. You might just have to get used to what you're doing. But at least use that as in, combined with other information, uh, what other people are doing, what your teacher's recommending, and so on. A lot of people have problems with picking in the beginning. And what the reason I came to a problem recently is because I was playing a lot of nylon string guitar and electric guitar. And I started doing a lot more on my acoustic guitar. And it causes a slight difference in picking technique. And I'm not even sure what is the best picking technique for the acoustic guitar that I'm trying to do. I'm playing a lot of melody stuff. <clears throat> so what was happening is I was using the same technique I use on my nylon, which is um, holding the pick like this. And that didn't work so well for me on the acoustic guitar. I needed to shift my adjust a, a little bit so that my finger is more sticking out and I'm hitting softer on the metal strings. Now, I'm saying this mostly to tell you that trying, I was trying experimenting a little bit and seeing what worked better. I still have to get used to it, but that's what I'm recommending is doing a little experimenting. Move your fingers around a little bit and see what's going on. In general, when I hold the pick, it's easier. By the way, a lot of students do hold the pick too tight and that does cause pain. So see how loose you can hold it without dropping it out of your hand. And I found that just slightly I can roll my thumb back and grasp more the back of the pick as opposed to the beginning, which allows it to wobble a little bit more, but still doesn't fall out. Also, I've started putting a little sticky thing on my pick. I got a few picks on the ground now. Let me see. Ah, here it is. Let me see. Uh, let me do this. There. There, it's focusing. There is little round sticky things. You probably can't see them too well right there. They're, they're little round sticky things that are clear. You can kind of see a picture of the pick right up there. They go on the pick and they make it easier to grab. It's subtle, but I really like it. It's working for me. And there's different versions of that. I used to, and this works probably just as well, but it's more hassle. I put a hole in my pick and that gives me a little something to grab onto, a little more than just the pick. Especially if, if I start getting a little bit sweaty, the pick slips out pretty easy. But that way I don't have to hold so tight to, to keep the pick from falling out. That's something you might want to try. Experiment. And again, don't just assume because it's a little bit of pain it's wrong, but try something and see if it changes the feel, feels a little easier, you can hold on a little bit better, and keep 
working with it. Be open. Be curious. Be curious. Well, what if I do this? What if I do this? In general, you've got the right idea. Get the thumb between the pad of your finger and the pad of your thumb. The pick between the pad of your finger and the pad of your thumb. And John also says the biggest problem I'm having is strumming. It looks simple when I watch tutorials, but when I try it, it sounds twangy. I am using a thin to medium pick. When I do an up strum, should I strum just the lower strings? Any ideas? Well, first of all, um, welcome to the club. This was something that haunted me for at least a year, I think, maybe longer. It's been a long time now, so I won't. But I remember that being an issue. I, God, it looks so easy. And I'm thinking of, I watched uh, some other guitar players there. Uh, it looks so easy. And when I go, it's. <laughs> what is wrong with me? <laughs> it fixed itself in a way. I mean, I made little adjustments and things, but it wasn't one thing that all of a sudden I got it. Little by little, I remember thinking one day I was uh, strumming campfire with some friends, and, I was, and I'm, I, I was just having a good time laughing, and all of a sudden I noticed it's, it's good. It sounds good. <laughs> I think I'd been playing about a year then, and I didn't really quite realize where my strumming kind of smoothed it out. It's a combination of hitting the strings not too hard, too soft, allowing a little bend in your wrist so that the pick goes this way when you're going down and this way, but it's subtle. I'm exaggerating now. It's just a little bit. Allowing uh, your pick to wobble a little bit, but not so much that it flies out of your hand. Again, the little hole is helping me right here. I'm using a thick pick, but I've been playing for a long time, so I can, you know, I can make a, the little adjustments. I recommend a thin or medium if you're just learning. Uh, even just stay with a thin and move up to a medium. The reason I like thick is when I go on to play melodies, the thin bends too much and like it makes sloppy melodies. So I want to be able to do like bass runs. And I need a thicker pick to do that and, and not just have the pick flopping around. But when you're starting out strumming with a thin pick, it's a good way to start and then move up to a medium. Um, now he's asking about when I do an up strum, should I just strum the lower strings? I think he's talking about these, the high E strings. I, John, if you're on the call, let me know. But I, I mean, when you're up strum, I'm not sure. These are the lower strings. I think he's talking lower in terms of distance. This is something sometimes I, I have to sort out with a student that's saying, I, uh, should I hit the, the low string? And they mean this string, low physically. So I'm going to just sort this out. This is the high string, and this is the low string. And we're talking, and when you talk musically, you talk pitch. This is the high string because it's higher in pitch, low. So he's saying, I'll assume, he's saying, do I just hit the high strings when I'm strumming up? Uh, generally, more of the high strings. Don't try to get all the strings on the up strum. That's a good point. When you strum down, try to go for more of the low strings, but it's subtle. Don't stress over too much. And then hit more of the high strings. As you progress, you'll find you can get a different sound by hitting more high and more full. Listen for a minute. I'm alternating low, high, low. It, it adds a, a little bit of motion to the strum. So that's a, sort of a little more advanced technique. When you're first starting out, the key is to get a fluid a, a hand that's relaxed, not so relaxed the pick flies out, and that your pick is adjusting as you're strumming up and down, just gliding over the strings and not digging in. Again, you could think this to your blue in the face, and it doesn't mean it's going to happen. You just keep making subtle adjustments over time and practicing. Practicing, hopefully, with chords and chord changes, little by little. Keep it simple, not 10 chords, because you need to be able to focus a little on your strumming. Narrow it down to just a few chords, simple changes, and, and then you can focus a little on your picking and do a little every day and work on it. Finally, Shulamit asks, what can... Uh, triads, aka baby chords, be used for. And I call these baby chords. Three note chords uh, that just have the notes for the chord. And I use these for a variety of purposes, sometimes just within the song for effect. To kind of break things up. 
it's more an advanced technique. I wouldn't recommend going there if you're just starting getting your chord changes down. And sometimes I'll use them when I'm doing uh, m uh, solo, melody playing. So I'll play... Uh, uh, I don't have anything prepared. So here's kind of a, a, a solo. I'll combine some melody notes with some baby chords for a, a guitar solo. And she's also asking if you can use the baby chord sometime in place of a regular chord because the regular chord's hard to play. Yes, but it is going to sound different. It depends on the style and the song and, and you know, your personal preference. So for an example, this is a C chord, D, E flat. The E flat is a hard chord to play on guitar. The one way to play it is by playing a bar, which is probably one of the harder bars. There are other ways to play it, but they're all kind of difficult. And she's asking, like, can you play this B flat in place of uh, one of the more difficult B flats? You can see it sounds very high pitched, so it may or may not fit what you have in mind. I hope that helps, Lamy. Let me go on now to the questions that are being asked live. And I'm going down the list looking for uh, questions, questions, question. As a beginner, I'm struggling to know when to play chords versus single notes. This is Cookie. So Cookie, if you want to say more about that, I'd be uh, open to answering it. But um, that's not enough information really for, for me to answer. It depends on what you want to do, basically. that's kind of a simple answer. Do you want to play melody guitar? Do you want to play chords, strumming? Uh, do you want to be able to do both? And you have to do both. Um, it depends. It's, um, so I'm going to leave that. I'm hoping you're on the, you're going to uh, elaborate on that a little bit more, maybe be a little more specific. Uh, let me see. Question. Do you have any advice for beginners wanting to learn to play an electric guitar. Um, sure. Um, I play all three, electric, acoustic, and nylon. They're, the basics are kind of all the same. I would say if you want to play electric guitar, learn the basic chords, including the open chords that you might think are mostly uh, folk style chords, but I still use those on the electric guitar. Um, one thing I will say is on electric guitar, uh, it's a little easier to press down, so you're going to be able to do bar chords easier. And I'd probably, if you're just wanting to play electric guitar, I would learn the open chords, but I would go to bar chords faster than I would on acoustic guitar. I wouldn't worry about getting all these perfect before I go to bar chords, because you're going to use a lot of bar chords, and they're easier on acoustic, uh, electric guitar. It's easier to play bar chords up and down the neck, because the strings are thinner and closer to the neck. Uh, and then a lot of it has to do with stylistic. When you say electric guitar, there's many different styles. And there are different things I would recommend depending on the styles that you want to learn. Of course, if you want to play lead guitar, you're going to need to practice a lot of scales and practice improvising, play chord changes and improvise over the chord changes. If you just want to play rhythm guitar, definitely start learning your keys and the chords in those keys and practice them in rhythm. It's really important if you're playing rhythm guitar to get good at the timing part of it. Uh, a rhythm guitar player who is sloppy with timing is useless. <laughs> okay, um, I'll stop there. Uh, and unless there's more of a specific question that you want to learn, ask about playing electric guitar, Joseph. Going on, mm, question, question. Uh, Fred asks, I have rather fat uh, square fingertips. I have tried lots of finger positioning to solve the problem. So I'm ready to do special order to get a steel string guitar with uh, a wider nut. He's asking for a 1 7 8 nut. Anyway, um, okay, um, that's one way to go. Uh, if you're... Um, open to some possibilities, you could also get a 12-string guitar and string it so that it only has six strings. So now you've got the wider neck of a 12-string, but six strings uh, of 
the acu- regular uh, acoustic guitar. Um, that might be just the solution. Of course, it saves you having to do a special order, and you have a lot more choices in 12-string guitars, all the way from cheap up to expensive. I think it's worth a try, uh, just because uh, ordering a custom-made guitar is usually both expensive, and if you don't like it, you're stuck. Question. This is Tom Four. How to stretch wide chords, short fingers. Um... Okay, so he's asking a question about stretching. Uh, I would recommend for anyone to do some uh, stretching exercises. The, the one, stretching exercises I like to do, first of all, for warm-up. This applies to everyone, so I'm having a little problem with the question. I'm, I'm thinking as I'm talking. But in general, I, I like to do this stretching exercise like this and then do these every time I play to warm up my fingers. And that will help you play chords, too. There are other stretching exercises. The other one I often recommend to students is this one. It serves as a kind of a warm-up, kind of like what I talked about before. But then you keep moving it back as you practice, and the stretch between your first finger and the pinky get wider and wider. So you're stretching your fingers out this way, and that'll help you with playing chords. Um, so now it becomes, I am wondering how advanced you are. Are you talking about stretching with some really elaborate chords or just a basic D chord you're having a hard time playing or G chord? In which case, you probably need to start with simpler chords and just work up little by little. That's I, a, a common issue I find with beginners. They try to jump into something that sounds good to them and they want to play it instead of trying to follow the steps and build up to it. Again, I couldn't know from your question exactly where you're at, but maybe that'll help. How do you, here's Greg's asking a question, how do you feel about uh, alternate picking for a beginner practicing with the speed developer exercise? <clears throat> so he's talking about uh, a speed developer exercise like this. And alternate picking is going down, up, down, up, down, up. I would start, if you're a brand new beginning, just down, and then go ahead and incorporate down, up, alternate picking. Alternate picking is... I mean, I have to use alternate picking. I, you have to go there eventually. There's another style of picking also. Um, I forget what it's called. That's where you hit one, two, three, and then you go down to the next string, one, two, three. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. But alternate picking, I think, is the first one to learn for a beginner. Unless you're playing, and you want to learn electric guitar and fancy lead, and that's really your focus. Then that, um, and again, the name will hit me in a minute. Uh, the other style of picking might be a good one to practice first. Eventually, you'll want to master both, alternate and this other style that I can't think of the name. Uh, if anybody thinks of it, please help me out. Uh, it's not an uncommon name, so I'm, I'm sure somebody on here will know what I'm trying to say. Uh, so in general, uh, I, I, I want you to do alternate picking. I just want to go... I don't want you to jump in alternate picking if you're just having a hard time getting the notes. What's more important than a speed developer for beginners is getting the left hand in the right place. So if you're worried about getting alternate and did I alternate that time, you're not going to be paying attention to what you're doing in the left hand. Next question. Should I risk putting on new strings on my electric guitar for the first time by myself? I've watched tutorial and it doesn't look too hard, but I still feel like I would mess it up. Well, uh, this is FY7. Um, I don't think uh, changing strings on electric guitar is too hard, especially if you're if you're going to watch a tutorial. And I think it's it's worth a try if you can find somebody who plays guitar to give you a little coaching or to be there. What we often do at my stores is somebody will say, "Can you change my strings for me?" Sure, but if you want. I'll stand around while you change the strings. I'll help customers, but you know I'll give you some pointers along the way because I want them to be able to change their own strings. It's it's awkward to if you break a string to have to run out and find somebody to change your string for you. Um, I think it's within it's it's within uh, reasonable to change them yourself. An electric guitar I think is easier than others, and you might mess it up. I would say have an extra pair set of strings, at least one, because a lot of beginners will cut their string too short or bust the string in the process. And that way you're not dead in the water. Um, maybe watch the tutorial a few times. Um, that's one thing that people go wrong. They 
like cut the string too short and it doesn't have enough windings around here, that'll do you in. And um, when you're tuning it the first time, that's hard. That's one of the hardest things. Once you get the strings on, is getting it in tune. That, it'd be really helpful to have somebody to help you because what a lot of beginners do is they'll keep tuning, say it's not in tune until it's too high and it snaps. That's a little tricky. If you play another instrument or if there's somebody around that could say, oh, here's the pitch. An electronic tuner is useful, but if you're too high, it just won't register. So that's an awkward space to be in. Uh, okay, next question. Hello, question. My fingers are very stiff and too short. What can I do? <laughs> More practice, Willie. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Um, I have heard so many times people's fingers are too short, too fat, too stiff. <laughs> I'm too old. There's nothing to do. You're, that's what you got. Start thinking about <laughs> just working with what you got, going slow, step by step. I've seen people with short, fat fingers play beautiful guitar. They just worked it until it worked. And do your stretching. If you're older like me, do your stretching, really. Um, and do stretching exercise on the guitar. Do this one. And again, I, what I do is I keep moving it back until it's a, a stretch. For some people, it's a stretch right here. So stop there. I'm just doing half, you know, one fret at a time all the way up and back. And if that's hard, start with three fingers until you can get the pinky incorporated. You're stretching your fingers this way. Uh, there's nothing to do. Start slow, go easy. Try not to jump too far ahead. That's what does people in. They're trying to do something that's too hard and they say, oh, something's wrong with me. No, back up to where you, you can do it and then keep adding little by little by little. It's okay to try and stretch once in a while, but you know, be realistic. Well, I tried that, yeah. Now I know where my limits are. Let me back up and do what I'm supposed to be doing. The other thing is, while they practice every day, a little bit at least. If you practice, and I'm not saying I, I don't know you, so I, this is not personal, but I see this all the time. Students practice, oh, I practice once, then let three days go by and practice again. Oh, my fingers are hurting. Yeah, they're gonna keep hurting. Practice every day a little bit. Yeah, maybe take Sunday off, that kind of thing. But, you know, close to every day, at least a little bit. Maybe some days practice a little more. The consistency was going to make it, one day you just look down and the fingers, wow, I didn't know they could do that. But it was the consistency over, keep coming at it. Okay, thanks for that, Willie. I just wanted to say all that stuff. <clears throat> it, uh, Iman is asking, I don't get the basics, PF music, and transposing, I, I don't understand that. If if you can rephrase the question, I'd be I'd be happy to try and answer it, but I don't even know where to start. Uh, I'll go on to the next one in the meantime. Question, should I not play bar chords on acoustic? I enjoy playing acoustic more and it is easier to make chord sound prints. I don't know what chord sound prints means. <laughs> Hey, anybody can help me out there. I'm probably just too old for that. <laughs> Miles, yeah, you should play bar chords, but work up to them. Start with your open chords. How are you going to play an F if you don't play bar chords? <laughs> or, you know, someday you're going to need a B flat. But start with the open chords. You're going to use them a lot more. And they're going to train your fingers. You're going to get strength and you're going to train to use these other fingers. So when you play bar chords, the, these three fingers can... Oh, that was, I, me, I meant to do this bar chord. So that's a stretch. But just bar chord like this, the F chord, which is, you're going to need the F chord, is you got to get strength in these three fingers right here and then the bar. Do it step by step. Work at the bar chord little by little. Work at strengthening the bar finger. Work at playing without the bar, these, and then put them together. Do it in a progressive way. I have lessons on my blog that show different exercises. Check out my blog, you'll find lots. And I'm not sure which is the best one for you, but there's at least a half a dozen. Try them all, see which ones work for you. Willie, very good and helpful. So many plastic picks. There are so many. How do, what is the difference between these? So he's asking uh, differences in picks. <clears throat> I'll give a, a brief overview. I have a whole blog post on this, and I'll, I'll put a link in that 
to that blog post. It'll go into more detail, but in short, there are different shapes, different materials, and different thicknesses. For most beginner guitar players, I would recommend a standard shape, which looks like this. Let me see. Can you guys see this? Again, I'm dealing with a focus issue. It'll focus in a second, I think. No, it won't. <laughs> I'll back up here then. Ah, okay. Oh, that's a pic with my face on. I didn't mean that. Ah, now I can see it. That's the standard shape. That's what I'm after. And um, um, basically, either a thin or medium. If you're strumming and you're brand new beginner, go with a thin. You can work up to a medium anytime you want. Have a medium handy and try it out from time to time. And go with celluloid, which is kind of that standard fendered pick. And there's tons of them. They're, celluloid is the name of a type of plastic. It kind of bounces back easy. It's not rubbery at all. Now, um, there are lots of other materials, and none of them are wrong. This one is called Delrin. It's a type of nylon kind of stuff. Um, they tend not to break as easily, but they're a little more flexible. This is a thick one. Um, they, that's, if you're strumming, they don't have quite that same snap as the celluloid. That's why I don't go with that. Then there's all these kinds of shapes, which I use on my nylon string guitar. Can you guys see that? Yeah, don't start with these little teeny picks. They're hard to hold on to. It's with experience, I, I use it for a very specific technique. I'm playing fast melodies on my nylon string guitar, and the, the little pointy part makes it sound like my fingers. But that's not what you want to use on a steel string when you're strumming kind of thing. And there's some big giant picks too. I don't know. I, I don't really like them, but you can try it and see if it fits you. That's not wrong. Go with... Um, it doesn't matter the brand, the, the materials is not copyright, but the standard fender pick is made out of celluloid. Then you'll see picks are nylon, um, Delrin, which is a kind of uh, type of nylon uh, uh, that's uh, branded. Um, there's some that are meant to imitate tortoise shell. Um, if you're just beginning, that's, it's not the time to worry about all that. Just get a good st standard fender pick and Practice your basics, and when you're playing uh, lead guitar and stuff, you want to try some smaller picks or some different materials, go for it. Again, it won't hurt you, but you'll see that it's not the best use of your time to just try billions of picks. I'll put a link to that blog post so that you can get a little more sense of what the materials mean. Hope that was helpful, Wally. Willie, Willie, sorry. Willie. Willie and Wally, two different people. Hybrid picking. Thank you, Shulamit. Yes, that's what I was looking for. Hybrid picking. So, uh, <laughs> alternate picking is every time you press down, then you go up. Hybrid picking is you go down, up, down, and then you go down again on the next string. Down, up, down, down, up, down. So it's kind of more efficient. You're not having to jump the string and go up again. But I actually it has a different sound. So that's why I say it's helpful to use both. It's a different sound when you, you're doing that down up constantly all the time. It has a, it's hard to explain, but it is a different sound. And a hybrid picking tends to work better on electric guitar where you don't have to hit very hard. The amp's doing all the work. But on acoustic and on my nylon string, I don't really use hybrid picking. I'm not saying some other people don't. They probably do, at least on this acoustic guitar. Okay. Thank you, Shulamir. I appreciate that. That was kind of bugging me. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for a question. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I'm going to take a quick glance, but I, I will tell you, if I don't see the word question, the chances of me seeing it are not very high. It looks like a lot of hi, I'm here. So, what I'm going to do is go on then. I don't see any more specific questions. <clears throat> and if you asked a question, but you, you just, and I missed it and I didn't see it, go ahead and you can, you can add it again at the bottom and put question in the, start off with the word question. So I'll, I'll see it right away. In the meantime, while we're waiting for that, I'm going to do the drawing for the month. And I just happen to have a hat full of, uh, <laughs> papers with the people who have completed the practice session for the month. And I said this in the beginning. These are people who are part of my Real Guitar Success Academy. They have a lesson every day, a session to practice, along with other things if they want. But if they do one session, 
uh, the 20 sessions in the month, they don't have to do it every day, but they do them in the month, complete the 20 sessions, they get entered into a drawing. It's just an incentive to kind of give you a little extra nudge to complete the sessions because they keep moving you forward in all aspects of playing guitar, strumming, chords, melody picking, some theories in there, uh, different kinds of uh, exercises for warm-ups. So, I give away a $50 Amazon gift card. And again, I'm just trying to give you a little nudge to do the sessions. And let's see what we got for the drawing this month. I can't see this anyway, so that's kind of show. <laughs> okay, this is Pat. Pat Rourke, you are the winner. And again, everybody who participated is a winner because you're a little better at guitar and hopefully you had fun doing it too. Thanks for playing along. Question, okay. I, somebody just needed that little bit of time. Been learning guitar for five, six months and realized that my left hand positioning is wrong. Oh my God. I grabbed the neck like a shovel. So my thumb faces the pegs. What is the best left hand technique? Good question. Uh, I'm glad you've only been playing five or six months. Now, just to be clear, I, I think, let me see. I'm going to go back to my guitar so you guys can see my guitar, okay? So he's saying he, I think he grabs it like this. He says the thumb is he headed towards the neck. And the best position is to have your thumb more like straight up and down and your hand angled over the strings like that, not around the neck. <laughs> but if you take your hand away, it would be like a leverage. See how my fingertips are going right into the ball of my thumb? So that's the problem with this is you lose your leverage. You see, your, now your hand's like this. And if you take your hand away and clasp it, you can feel you have so much less power this way press the fingertips against your palm. It's so much less than when you can feel with the same amount of muscle, you can put twice, three times the force this way. So it's much easier to make a nice chord with less effort if your thumb is kind of right behind the neck there. Try not, some people put their thumb around the neck like this. It's not wrong. Some famous people play like this. But if you're a beginner, you have more leverage if you put your thumb behind the neck. And if it's a habit, it's better to get started this way. If you've been doing this for years and you're fine with it, leave it. It's not a problem. Uh, and sometimes I do this anyway because I want either to clamp a bass note or for other reasons. But mostly, I keep my hand thumb behind the neck. And when I do a bar chord, I really need it back there. I can't clamp up like this and do a bar chord. You see my hand collapses. Unless I was going to play the bass note like this, which you know, I, I see some people do, but uh, most people will play a bar chord like this. So thumb basically up and down. Try to stay relaxed. Just enough pressure so if you let go, your hand will fall away. Not so you're clamping harder than you need to clamp. That'll make you sore after a while. Hope that helps. And I see I got another question. Do you play any reed jig by chance? No. <laughs> no jigs and no reed. Question. I don't... I don't know how to play fast guitar solo. Any tips? James. W well, yes. Uh, start with slow guitar solos. And before that, practice scales. Um, that's, and that's a specific tip. And then, of course, it, it has to do with style. And I assume you're playing electric guitar if you're playing solo, but the style of music you want to play. But the biggest tip I can tell you is a lot of people try to play fast solos. And you've said that when they're not able to play slow first. And playing fast before you can play slow is bound to not only be hard, but to help instill bad technique that will slow you down perpetually. So start slow, get the fingers in the right place, do scales and exercises, and then play solos a little bit each day. Be patient. It's going to take time. Not even to play fast, just to play good solos slow. And I would recommend, and I know, you know, I am I was as guilty as this when I was younger too. I want to play fast and impressive. But a real solo, you'll learn over time, a real solo is not about fast. A real solo is communication, playing the right notes at the right time with spaces and and learning what makes an effect, what makes the sound you want. And and that takes patience and practice and doing a little every day, not only the scales, but actually playing chord changes and playing the scales and, and trying to make melodies that sound good over them. 
So I, I know it's hard to hear that when you're young, you want to play fast and, and impressive. But in the long run, that's what will make good solos is playing the right notes at the right time. Hybrid picking is using a pick and fingers. So I understand this differently. I'm talking about the type that some people call hybrid picking that has to do with just a pick and it's the way you pick down and up. Uh, maybe there's another type of hybrid picking that has to do with picking fingers. Question, what would be a good strum pattern for the song Take Me Home Country Roads? Well, I happen to know that song. Usually I would say, well, I couldn't tell you for a specific song, but um, I would say any strum pattern that sounds good to you. And, and I don't mean to be um, sarcastic. I, I really mean that trying to copy an exact strum pattern when you're first learning is not as important as just getting the chord changes and something that sounds good with the song. In general, I would say, I would start with down, down, up, down, up, down. Do, down, 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 down. <clears throat> that one sounds normal to me. It's kind of down, 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 down. But what I was doing is seeing the low strings and the high. That's a little more advanced. If you're a brand new beginner, I would stick with just something like that and work into more advanced drums. It's a simple song, by the way, and I will tell you this, down, uh, Country Roads doesn't require any kind of complicated strum pattern. Uh, this is probably how I would play if I was playing a singer. Almost heaven, West I don't remember the chords right away, but that kind of dun da da dun da da dun da 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 dun da. And you start off, if you're a beginner, just getting this down, down, up, down, up, down. Then you add the subtleties of hitting more the low and the high strings as you progress. Jack. Oh, uh, uh, Bubba, what you described is called an alternate chord. Hmm. If you use them. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Jazz. Okay. So I think that's it for the questions for today. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, let's get back to it. <laughs> I'm going to close up for today. I will be back next month, the first Thursday of every month. Uh, and, and I hope you can join me. And if not, I do always record the session so you can submit a question ahead of time. And all the members that have been here of my Real Guitar Success Academy, thank you for supporting me. Thank you for trusting me to be your guitar teacher. I look forward and I'm working right now six days a week to create more lessons and more value. But please let me know if there's anything that you'd like to see me make that I could do to improve the membership or to add some more value for you. Now, if you're going to leave me a comment, please leave it below on YouTube. And I really would encourage you, even if you just say hi. The thing is, this chat session, I won't see it after I close up for today. But if you leave me a comment on YouTube in the comment section, I can go back and I will respond. I read every single comment and I'd love to hear from you, especially if there's something you'd like to see me make a, a lesson on. So with that, I'll say goodbye and I look forward to seeing you, if not before, next month. Take care.